It is uh, my great pleasure to um, introduce you, Dr. Matthew Altman, um, who is a local uh, colleague and, and collaborator to uh, several of you in this room, including myself. So I've known Matt for uh, probably eight or 10 years now um, since he started his fellowship here. Uh, a little bit about his, his background. So he is a Seattle native. Um, and then he went to, down to Stanford where he completed his bachelor's degree in mathematics. He was also an accomplished rower, uh, which I did not know about him. So he was awarded the Pac-10 All-Conference Men's Rowing Championship Award while he was at Stanford, 2004. So uh, accomplished athlete there. Uh, he then went on to complete his uh, MD at Harvard, uh, a master's of philosophy at Cambridge in biological science. Uh, and then he completed his residence here, here in internal medicine. I'm sorry, not here, at the Brigham, and then completed his fellowship here at the University of Washington. He uh, is currently an associate professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and also serves as the section head for allergy um, at UW. And he also is an associate scientist in Systems Immunology Division at BRI. And that's where uh, my, myself and several of us in this room have collaborated with him over the years in that role as an accomplished computational biologist, particularly in the area of transcriptome analysis of airway and immune cells in the asthma world, where he's been quite accomplished and very productive, particularly in the context of the inner city asthma uh, network. And he's going to talk to us today. His talk is entitled Airway Transcriptome Pathways in Childhood Asthma Exacerbations and Responsiveness to Mepolizumab. Thank you, Matt. Great. Well, thanks, Jason, for the very kind introduction and, and for inviting me. And it's good to be here. I was trying to remember, I, you know, I used to come here every week, uh, if not more, um, back in the day. And I don't think I've been here since before the pandemic. So it's nice to be back in the building, see familiar faces and, and new as well. And thanks, everybody, for your attention. So, yeah, you know, this can be as informal as, uh, obviously, I don't want to derail things. But uh, if people want to interrupt me, you know, there's a lot of complicated well, there's a lot of different things here. There's biology, there's methodology, there's various stuff. So if something's not clear or you just want to ask about a specific part, feel free. <clears throat> here are my disclosures. So um, the Sanofi uh, part is not relevant to this. I have not done any dupilumab uh, studies to date. Um, most of my funding comes from NIH, as you can see there, largely in uh, large clinical consortiums, but also some you know smaller um, uh, uh, projects as well. Uh, so here's what I kind of want to get through, and I have kind of, as I was splicing this talk together, you know, different different pieces, different topics. So the main goals will be what you see kind of in, in the darker color there. I'm going to talk a little bit, just five minutes background about what what is asthma, what is endotyping and, and molecular definition of asthma. Um, I put in gray, because this is part of a talk I gave not too long ago, how do we actually do systems biology? And I only left it there to say, if it's something you're interested in, I have talks about it, I've given seminars about it, I'm always happy to teach and include people because it is an important but sometimes black box area. So, you know, again, I'm happy to talk about that at a future um, time. Anyway, then I'll talk about transcriptomics and defining airway inflammatory pathways, specifically in pediatric, pediatric asthma. Uh, how different triggers affect different asthma pathways, uh, and then how we've now utilized therapeutics to understand biomarkers of response and non-response to drug. If we have time, I may also talk about uh, a little more focused questions, some stuff we've done with Jason um, in particular, focused on how the interferon response uh, seems to play out in this whole story of pediatric asthma, and then how that relates, how asthma relates to SARS-CoV-2 infection but that's all time dependent. So let's just kind of spend a couple minutes on background. So asthma is an immunologic disease um, and that's been known for over a hundred years. Uh, first, just through sort of the observation of coincident disease, people who have allergies, atopic dermatitis, most often get asthma. That led to a number of observations in the eighties and nineties, first in animals and then in humans of type two inflammatory markers. So TH2 cells, type two cytokines, for example, IL-4, IL-5 being elevated, in this case, in uh, lung T cells in asthma. Uh, and this sort of coined this notion of asthma as a type two disease, a TH2 driven disease. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, there was this, this identification of eosinophils and then mast cells as being critical. So this is just some work by Sally Wenzel. 
uh, from a while back showing that you can actually have elevated eosinophils in the lung across a spectrum of severity of asthma, but in particular, when they're elevated in more severe disease, you're more prone to life-threatening outcomes, in this case, uh, having a history of um, asthma-related intubation. <clears throat> and then probably the sort of canonical, so to speak, um, endotyping study in asthma is this work by Prescott Woodruff down at UCSF, where he really defined what we now think of as TH2 or T2 asthma. So the idea that you can take airway epithelial cells um, and look at their gene expression pattern, in this case, in response to IL-13, and define a subgroup in red. If I have a mouse here. Well, you can see, so in red, um, uh, the individuals who clearly have this response in this three gene signature, periostin, click A1, and serpent D2, and then others who don't. And this kind of gave us this picture of there being not only T2 asthma, but T2 high or T2 low or non-T2 asthma. That corresponded with type 2 cytokines, eosinophils, and some um, clinical characteristics. <clears throat> so this left us with our basis, basic paradigm that there are these endotypes in the broadest sense, T2 high and T2 low uh, of asthma. Um, this has given us important therapeutics. So the idea of targeting, for example, mast cells and IgE through anti-IgE therapy or sort of the overlapping but not purely the same eosinophilic asthma and drugs that target, for example, IL-5, the cytokine necessary for eosinophil development, IL-4, IL-13, and now also things like the epithelial drive cytokines. So that's the framework on which we have to build for asthma. <clears throat> so what we've tried to do in our own work, I'm gonna now just uh, advance to kind of our first uh, major study in this area was to use uh, a systems biology approach to more broadly define airway inflammatory pathways that exist. And specifically, we focused on the urban asthma epidemic um, in part because that's where my funding is and in part because um, these children tend to have more common and more severe asthma. It really is uh, an epidemic within this country and elsewhere. So one thing that uh, is very important to note in the field of asthma is so those endotypes I defined, we kind of think of them as static, right? You either have type 2 inflammation, you don't. You have eosinophilic inflammation, you don't. That's probably not true. And one of the reasons we know that's probably not true is sort of the uh, aggravation of asthma, the exacerbations of asthma <clears throat> are very seasonal. And this seasonality can really differ by individual. But you can have quite quiescent disease throughout the summer, we see this large spike in asthma exacerbations in the fall, which has largely been attributed to viruses, in particular rhinovirus. We see winter spikes, we see spring spikes, which are more thought to be um, allergen, or there's been this very interesting phenomena of um, a lightning induced, which is thought to aerosolize allergen. So, you know, there are different drivers, people have different activity states at different times. It's clearly not just a static picture. So this is what we, first sought to understand in this paper we published now a number of years ago, what we called the Muppets One trial, which has this long name you can see there, but basically identifying mechanisms of asthma exacerbations in children. So what we did here in effect was just enroll a, a cohort of children with what we call exacerbation prone disease or severe disease, <clears throat> meaning that in the prior year they had two or more, anywhere from two to seven exacerbations. Um, you know, these children can have very active disease. We gave them a smartphone and basically recorded day-to-day -day symptoms um, with the idea that in so doing, we could not only capture, you know, detailed um, clinical information about the severity of their disease, but also bring them back to get samples during illnesses, which had to date not been done nearly as much as obviously getting just scheduled samples, um, which is how T2 high and low had been defined. <clears throat> so, you know, we had about 106 children there, about um, uh, one and a half illnesses on average per participant, and we were just stratifying by exacerbations and not. So what did we actually collect? Well, we collected uh, airway and blood samples, and it's hard to get lower airway samples been shown here and in many other studies that the upper airway can be a very nice proxy for what's going on in the lower airway. So we basically just did a sinus lavage, collect a mixed cell sample of epithelial and immune cells, and from that delineated cell differentials, virology, microbiome, and in particular, a transcriptomic data. So just simple mRNA sequencing. 
And then similarly from blood, collect blood during illness, give blood counts and uh, RNA sequencing. <clears throat> Our core questions were to identify the fundamental pathways in the airway and the blood during exacerbations versus non-exacerbation illnesses, baseline immune states, which I'll kind of come back to later in the talk that predict um, your likelihood of um, having exacerbation, and then different exacerbation subtypes. So I said there's you know viral, allergen, and so forth. Are these all driven by the same mechanism or not? And how does that influence how we might treat them? And then I, I won't show it at this point, but there we can look at therapeutic intervention with corticosteroid. I'll show you later in the talk how therapeutic intervention with biologic therapies affects these. So this is where the sort of magic, you know, black box, it's really not that. And again, anybody who is interested in learning these types of approaches, uh, my lab is increasingly doing teaching around this. But, you know, fundamentally, we're just taking a large data set. So about 30,000 variables of gene expression, 11 cell types, this is across airway and blood, and using that data to um, uh, identify in an unsupervised manner the structure of the data. So basically, how are things correlated with one another? <clears throat> and what this does is it markedly reduces the dimensionality of the data set to, in this case, 92 modules. That's what's shown um, in sort of the second row there. And uh, also, you know, identifying key patterns um, within the data that you can functionally interpret. So that's what's shown in this network plot. One of the 92 modules we identified is this, you know, fairly canonical type two inflammatory pathway. IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and so forth, which is what you would expect. So some of these modules are obvious known biology, some of them are more novel. <clears throat> then in that reduced dimensionality space, we can do our typical linear, nonlinear modeling, all sorts of different statistics. Um, in this case, we use um, what's called a generalized additive model, or, or actually here we were using low S regression, but it's similar, basically a nonlinear fit of longitudinal data over time to basically define a kinetic pattern of, you know, what goes up, what goes down during an illness. Uh, and, and just to, again, kind of put it into basic ideas, it's just a combination of an unsupervised analysis, clustering data, plus a supervised analysis, comparing groups of interest. So the first question was just, what's the difference between an illness that causes an asthma exacerbation? And that was defined as need for corticosteroids or hospitalization versus just a respiratory illness that self-resolves. So that's what's shown here, red being those exacerbations, black being those non-exacerbations. And what I'm showing here is just one of the 92 modules. There were about 20 that showed a significant pattern. Um, and this one you can see, uh, so BL is baseline, and that's days after cold onset. You can see a very uh, rapid and sort of brisk upregulation of this pathway during an illness that will exacerbate. And exacerbations tended to happen around day three, four, five. So this actually precedes the clinical exacerbation in these participants. And, you know, there's definitely some recognizable biology here. It's not what we thought would be the top hit. Um, but as I'll show you as I go through this talk, this has come up over and again. This clearly had, this first off was deconvoluted to the epithelium as opposed to an immune cell uh, and clearly has to do with um, uh, TGF-beta, SMAD3 signaling within that airway epithelium, which, you know, has been implicated in cell models and mouse models to various things, including remodeling and fibrosis and otherwise. But anyway, here showing a very clear signal of what will become an exacerbation. Just to show a contrasting example where we can dissect out a kinetic difference with the time points we had, here is what we thought of as more of an effector pathway because it happened later in the illness. This has to do with eosinophil activation, mucus hypersecretion, including MUC5AC, which is the canonical uh, sort of pathogenic mucin in asthma and other diseases. So here, again, a, a stark difference between the illness groups and um, coming up later. So again, that's just a snapshot of a number of things we found, but the idea is now we can ask how these relate to different types of exacerbations or treatments. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Yep, yep, yep. We did the blood also. Part of the reason I focus on the airway here is the reality is 95% of the signal we found is in the airway. 
Um, we did see some congruence between the airway and blood. For example, as I'll, I'll maybe talk about at the end, interferon signatures. So we see a very congruent interferon response in blood and airway. Um, but something like this is only happening in the airway. And it speaks to the importance of sampling the organ of interest here. As to the epithelial component of this, you know, this just gets to the biostatistics. You know, basically we had both, we had histologically defined cell counts in these samples. Um, and we used basically just a fancy correlative analysis to say, here are the genes that are correlated with the epithelium, and then here's how they structure into modules. In our current work and in evolutions of this, we've also now done single cell work to, you know, then identify specificity of what we see in bulk data and single cell data. So, so this is not specific, uh, or sorry, let's go back one. This one, again, through this deconvolution, uh, uh, related very specifically to ciliated epithelial cells within these samples. This one actually <laughs> was pretty correlated with both eosinophils and the epithelium. So in this case, it's not necessarily listed here, but we called this epithelial slash eosinophil derived. Now we don't actually know what's generating these genes, right, through the statistical deconvolution. That's where you need to go to a single cell approach. Um, but you know, the general notion is that uh, where you have more epithelial cells, you have more of this, where you have more eosinophils, you have more of that, and same for the other modules we identified to the different cell types. So we quantified in this case, we didn't quantify mast cells histologically because you can't, um, but we've now done that again, um, bioinformatically through single cell marker genes. But we quantified two epithelial cell types, ciliated, non-ciliated, eosinophils, um, macrophages, neutrophils, and uh, lymphocytes. Well, yeah, I mean, you can see, so we don't have, in, in, this, in this study, we didn't have a like two week later sample to ask that baseline question. I have that in our next study. You know, here we really just see the dynamic from what they were before an illness to what they were then throughout an illness. But you can see definitely several of them trending down. And it's also complicated by the fact that these kids, if they have an exacerbation, they get steroids at day four, five, six, seven. Part of the paper that I'm not showing here is we actually described of these pathways, which one go back to, to normal after steroids and which ones don't. We were able to dissect that out. And basically this, uh, sorry, this one, this epithelial pathway had no, or it had, a, let's say a marginal response to steroids. So this seems to be steroid refractory. Whereas for example, the eosinophil pathways were very steroid sensitive. So, you know, some expected biology there. <clears throat> These are good questions because ultimately this gets to how, not only how do we do this, but how do we interpret, you know, the meaning of this. So again, that's two of 20 pathways that showed up. I'll show you a bit of a cartoon summary in a bit, but kind of the next question was going back to that idea of are all asthma exacerbations the same or not? Uh, we were trying to dissect out subgroups of exacerbations and, and the triggers therein. So one of the things we immediately saw just through an unsupervised clustering of our data was that if you look at those exacerbations where a virus was detected versus not, blue versus red, there's a very clear distinction. I mean, this was night and day. And so we then looked, you know, what are the modules loading, the loadings behind this difference, so to speak. And we could see that for some of these pathways, so going back to this TGF beta SMAD3 pathway I showed you a moment ago, seems pretty similar. Uh, in viral and non-viral exacerbations. That's the purple and the red. You know, maybe a different kinetic there, hard to say, but generally this is upregulated in both. In contrast, there were pathways that were highly unique to one or the other. So this is this, we call it IL-33. I actually think IL-33 is a small piece of this, but this ciliated epithelial response, you can see a number of the important molecules there, including CDHR3, which is actually the entry factor for rhinovirus C, FOXJ1, an important differentiation factor for the ciliated epithelium, you know, really uniquely an early increase in viral exacerbations only, suggesting that, you know, okay, so if you target this pathway, you might treat viral exacerbations, you're not going to treat others, right? That's the very simplistic notion uh, of these sorts of findings and why it may be ultimately very hard to cure all asthma exacerbations. And just as a contrast, 
same cohort, you know, all the same, but here for those non-viral exacerbations, a pathway that was fairly unique uh, there. And, you know, we don't know what causes a non-viral exacerbation at this stage in our, at the time I, we were doing this analysis, but it was clearly driven through alternative pathways. Here are a lot of tissue calocrines. So, you know, one of the summaries from all that work was we can put together pieces. Again, I've only shown you a few of these modules, but here were the ones that showed up aggregated in viral exacerbation. So the IL-33, the type two inflammation, the SMAD3 TGF beta, I didn't show you the interferon, all these effector pathways. And there were then shared and different um, in this non-viral group where we see more of a sort of non-ciliated epithelium, tissue calocrine e adherin response as the early events in an exacerbation. So then the big question, yeah. Sorry, that's Sorry, that's no, it's great. You mean the two modules that I showed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so delineating the blue. So it's a good question. We, um, the short answer is we have not uh, fully sorted that out yet. Um, if you did an unsupervised clustering of this, you would come up with more than two clusters as the solution. And for the purposes of this paper, we just stuck with the two clusters and basically looked at the difference. Um, We've now done this in another cohort, so we double our data size. We're looking at all these distinct clusters and both what are the triggers of each cluster and what are the molecular pathways of each cluster. But it goes a level beyond what I have to show today. It, kind of a, a related question on the non-viral side, you've got a lot of rich clinical data. So are you? I'm sure you're, you, there's sample size issues when you start looking at different viruses and all these environmental triggers, but are you looking at things like environmental smoke exposure or other environmental factors that might be driving the non-viral? Yeah, so I'll show you what we found for the non-viral here in a second. Um, to that point, you know, when we conducted this study, we had all these pre-specified hypotheses of compare viral, non-viral, compare high BMI, low BMI, compare season. And suffice it to say, there were a number of signals that came out even in the sort of subsetting. We went with this one because it was the screaming signal, the obvious one. Um, but we've actually, in abstracts and other smaller publications, shown, for example, the BMI signal. So actually, the BMI signal is, is somewhat congruent with the non-viral signal. Uh, so we tend to see the non-viral exacerbations in individuals with a higher BMI. Um, and as I'll show you in a moment, we also see it uh, very much associated with pollution exposure. So we're trying to disentangle, you know, trigger by pathway um, as we accrue larger and larger data sets. <clears throat> um, to that point, let me just show you. So actually the first thing, because, you know, the reviewer, of course, asked what's a non-viral exacerbation. So we tried to answer that. The first thing we did, which I'll, I'll show in a slide in a minute, was to generate microbiome data uh, from these samples. So to look for a bacterial cause. And we didn't find one, uh, I, I, which was surprising. Um, you know, we thought it would be more Excella or something like this, but there was no specific bacteria, at least in the upper airway, relevant to the non-viral. So um, we looked at a few other data sets, but ultimately we arrived on pulling all of this EPA um, pollution data, which was kind of roughly geocoded to the participants. Not a perfect, this is been a new space that I've uh, uh, now delved into and is kind of relevant as we think about our own environment outside. <laughs> but basically what we found was air quality index, largely driven by particulate matter and ozone, um, was quite specifically elevated during these, I've changed the color on you, but green is now not the non-viral exacerbations. And it's taken a lot of doing, but I think this paper is about to be accepted. Um, uh, to, to convince, um, this signal was very clear. We actually showed this across multiple cohorts um, that uh, these, these two pollutants and to a lesser extent NO2 were specifically elevated during non-viral exacerbation events. What the trickiest thing to convince was then linking these to the modules. So we saw, for example, this is a, a zoomed out view of that tissue calocrine module, but we saw that as quite, you know, 
specifically related to PM 2.5 levels, and there were a few others as well, suggesting that one is driving the other, presumably PM 2.5 driving module expression, of course, um, but it's just associative. And then, for example, we saw ozone being related to type 2 inflammation. And, you know, it's hard to make definite conclusions here, but uh, the, the notion would be because we saw both elevated that, you know, sort of an aggregated exposure to both uh, or a very high exposure to one or the other could independently drive um, an exacerbation event. So it was a nice expansion. We think we've identified a, at least a, a relatively common trigger of many of those non-viral events. This seems to hold up in a data set we've just completed as well. Um, uh, so a reasonable explanation. And again, I'll just I'll just mention that I probably I'll just briefly talk about this slide. This was the microbiome work. What we found there was rather than this being specific to non-viral <clears throat> viral exacerbations, there were certain microbial networks as assessed just by 16S DNA sequencing um, that seemed to compound the relevance of some of these modules. So higher uh, existence of this. Uh, streptococcus network when in conjunction with higher expression of the SMAD3 TGF beta module seemed to increase exacerbations. Um, but again, it, it was sort of uh, not, not nearly as specific as the pollution finding. I really show this just as a way of, you know, how we're increasingly integrating across omics data sets. This next one I'll focus on a bit. I think it's pretty exciting and maybe relevant to, to people in this room. So we've kind of, uh, in a couple of ways, expanded how we can look at genetic and then epigenetic contributors to what we found here. So this was a very first pass um, analysis that we did where um, we basically just took free data from the RNA sequencing. So you can derive SNP data from RNA-seq uh, pretty easily uh, and just look for cis EQTL effects. So expression quantitative trait loci. And for those pathways and for those genes that we saw as significant contributors to exacerbations, we asked, you know, how does host genotype influence this? And one of the major findings that came out of it was this MUC5AC signature, which had not previously been described, in part because the human genome was lacking part of this region for a while until like 2016. Um, but basically, we saw that a number of SNPs in this region um, very uh, well, they significantly associated with the relative expression of MUC5AC, and moreover, that this was actually inducible during illnesses. So in individuals in, um, or in red is the uh, exacerbation illness, whereas black are the non-exacerbation illnesses. Depending on the number of alternate alleles you had at this SNP or any SNP in this loci that was in linkage disequilibrium, you could identify basically a higher induction of MUC5AC during those exacerbations. So sort of accounting for much of the heterogeneity, we actually showed this accounted for a pretty significant amount of the variance that we saw in MUC5AC expression during those exacerbations. And we had what's on the left versus the right is two independent uh, genetic loci that together both contributed to this. So that was kind of neat, again, identifying now host factors that seem to be driving a specific part of the endotype of the exacerbation. Um, what we've done uh, to move beyond that, and I really just attribute this to Carol Ober, my colleague in Chicago, and this again is something that might be relevant to anybody who's sort of working with RNA-seq and genomic type data, especially in the field of asthma. So Carol is a phenomenal collaborator. Um, she has actually developed um, a, a new uh, methylation array uh, targeted to allergic and asthma diseases. So you guys, anybody who's worked in the methylation space may know, you can kind of do it a couple different ways. You can do whole genome bisulfate sequencing, which is really expensive and really painful. Um, uh, or you can use the Illumina methylation chip, which is really only good for cancer research. Uh, so what she did was she took a bunch of asthma data, um, did whole genome bisulfate sequencing, identified differentially methylated sites across asthma by race, age, ethnicity, so forth, uh, and then built her own chip working with Illumina to identify a bunch of differentially methylated sites that seem relevant to sort of type 2 diseases. And we've now used that in a couple of publications you can see listed there to identify how genes affect methylation, affect gene expression, or vice versa, how genes affect gene expression to affect methylation. 
with the idea that these are modifiable risk factors or you know, modifiable theoretically that are driving these pathways of exacerbation. So I'll just show you an example. Uh, they've developed this pipeline. We've been involved in it largely in contributing the gene expression analysis, um, where you can now look at uh, differentially methylated sites across the genome. Again, we usually do this in a cis manner. So looking at this case at the gene CISH, which is a T2 response gene, and identifying all these um, methylation sites so uh, um, that exist in that gene locus. And they're colored here in particular to highlight this custom array. So the red, uh, basically the red, blue, um, sorry, the red, purple, and light blue are the ones that she built onto her own chip uh, and are all the significant findings, where if you just use the basic Illumina Epic array, you'll find almost nothing uh, as being significantly associated in, uh, with gene expression. So that's what's then shown on the right, that dependent on the degree of methylation at this site, it uh, tracks very nicely with the relative expression of this gene, which is in our type two module. Um, uh, and again, allows you to now further build beyond what might be a genetic cause to now an epigenetic cause of differential expression of a given pathway. So again, not, not to tell the whole story here, but just to suggest the value uh, of combining genetic, pretty easy to access epigenetic and transcriptomic data to really pinpoint etiologies of these, um, uh, you know, of these expression differences we're seeing by illness type. All right, so I'll move to sort of the last um, portion of the main portions of my talk, um, which is some pretty exciting work we just published this summer where we've taken all that infrastructure we just built and asked, how can we actually use this in a clinically relevant setting to understand how a drug works, why a drug works, and in whom a drug works? Uh, so that's what this is, utilizing therapeutics to discover kind of the next step. So um, the research question, um, well, the main, this was our RCT. So the real question, the RCT question was, can you use a phenotype-directed therapy, anti-IL-5, um, to reduce asthma exacerbations in kids? This hadn't really been shown for those of you who know the therapeutic space of asthma. These studies are all done in white adults, not in um, ethnically, di ethnically diverse children. Um, so it's important to ask this question uh, in that sort of population. But again, what we really wanted to add in addition to the clinical efficacy was the mechanisms. So this is now the Muppets 2. That's why we called the other one Muppets 1. Uh, we were ultimately now really getting to the immune-based therapy. Um, and it was a similar cohort. So children 6 to 17 years old, severe exacerbation-prone asthma, at least modestly elevated eosinophils. And we just, you know, simple design, treat them with a year of therapy, anti-IL-5, or a year of placebo. And look at the rate of asthma exacerbations, which is what this drug is most clinically effective for in adults. Uh, so this was published in the Lancet last month. Um, I'll get to the clinical result in a second. First off, there was a cl very clear pharmacodynamic effect. This is what every study of IL-5 directed therapy shows that with mepolizumab, you, you know, markedly decrease eosinophils, which is great. Uh, but of course, the downside to this is this has no relevance to clinical effect. Unless everybody responds 100% to the drug, this is not going to predict responder status. So clearly the eosinophil may be relevant, but not driving um, response to drug. So here was the main clinical outcome, which is actually kind of underwhelming, um, which was good for us. So it just reached statistical significance, P of 0.027, in reducing the rate of exacerbation annualized in MEPO on, uh, in blue, placebo in red. Um, and the rate was less than we typically see. So in adults, the uh, uh, rate ratio is about 0.5. Um, and also now in some pe other pediatric, um, uh, well, in, I'll say in adolescent data. And here we saw, you know, just a rate of 0.73. So we kind of just, just squeaked in there in terms of significance. But this gave us a really, a real range of response, i.e. the decrease or the number of exacerbations um, to look at, you know, pathways driving this. So that came to part two of this paper, which is this figure, and which is a lot, uh, I grant you, but I'm going to walk you through it and then show you in a more granular approach what this actually means. 
So here I'm listing, I think it's 12 modules of the you know 50 some modules we had from airway samples um, that basically related to response or non-response both with mepolizumab or with placebo. And that's what's shown in these bar charts. So this is actually a, a partial least squares regression analysis where we're looking at all these modules in aggregate relative to the exacerbation rate and treatment. And basically as the arrows kind of indicate uh, the, the bigger the bar is to the right, the more exacerbations you have. The bigger the bar is to the left, the fewer exacerbations you have. And so they're sort of detrimental versus protective in a sense, if you want to think of it that way. And I should say this is all expression at baseline in the study. So when you're enrolled. So what you can see is on the top, there are these three eosinophil pathways or eosinophil associated type 2 inflammation and carcinoid metabolism, and then these sort of cytoplasmic proteins for lack of a more specific annotation. And all of those, the higher your expression at baseline, the more likely you are to have a lot of exacerbations if you're treated with placebo. That made sense. Um, in the sort of middle gray section are the epithelial path uh, associated pathways. So we saw a host of these, inclusive of the one I described earlier, the TGF beta SPAD3, that paradoxically, the higher you are with that, the more exacerbations you have if you're on mepolizumab. And I'll show you what that looks like in a linear, in a regression plot in a second. And then there are some that are sort of mixed. So the eosinophil activation, mucus secretion that I showed you the genetic association to, kind of a bad thing regardless. If you have an increased expression of it, you tend to have more exacerbations with or without therapy. And then among the protective ones, if you look at the bottom two, neutrophil and type one interferon sort of seemed protective with or without therapy. So what does that look like in a more basic plot? Well, here's an example. This is just to kind of ground the biology. This is the type two inflammatory module I've, I've kind of alluded to in uh, earlier portions of the talk. And the idea is that, again, the higher your module expression, uh, the greater your exacerbation rate throughout the study, only on placebo, not on mepolizumab. And what I didn't explain in that prior figure what was in the right hand is that this is specifically decreased by mepolizumab throughout the study. That's what the bar, uh, the um, box plot shows, uh, and it's unaffected by placebo. In stark contrast, this is that TGF beta SMAD3 module, where you know in aggregate the whole population decreases their exacerbations. That's why the and, and I apologize the color changed here because uh, I forgot to update to the ones they <clears throat> made us change the color to. But green, mepolizumab, you know, on average, they're going to have lower exacerbations. But as you get to the more extreme levels of expression, these guys actually have high, as high, if not higher, rates of exacerbation than does placebo. And if you look on the right, this module is actually increased over time in aggregate on mepolizumab therapy. So we didn't really write this in the paper because it would be a little bit probably too extreme to claim but this appears to be a detrimental effect of the drug, right? So you block type two inflammation, that's good for a lot of people, or eosinophilic inflammation, let's say, um, but you can see this counter upregulation uh, of epithelial pathways that account for residual disease in kids who don't respond well to therapy. That's kind of the overall message. Just to take it a step further, and this actually didn't end up in the paper, and so the colors are gonna throw you off, but I'll walk you through it. So this was our primary clinical result, and that's great. We then stratified by the by the relative expression of these pathways um, using an interaction, uh, a model-based partitioning uh, interaction. Um, and basically what you can see is, depending on your relative expression of two or more of these pathways, it really dictates if you're gonna do well or not. So on the left are people who are low in both one of the eosinophil modules and the epithelial module. You can see there they have pretty low rates of exacerbation, relatively speaking, and there's no difference with drugs. So those people don't need the drug as much and aren't going to respond to it anyway. In the middle is kind of what you would expect, the, the um, good responders. So we can really identify people who have a high rate of response. Relatively speaking, they have high eosinophil module expression, low epithelial module expression, and you see the largest change and a much more significant p-value in this subgroup. And then the furthest one, uh, the opposite of that. Again, people who actually start with this higher epithelial expression um, are those who not only don't respond, but do poorly on the drug. Uh, 
So these are all from baseline. I'll show you how it looks in a flare in just a second. It's amazingly congruent. <clears throat> important the epithelium is in as I agree I mean you know I have to tell you when we started this however many years ago um, I didn't think there was going to be any epithelial signature especially in these samples these are lavage samples mixed cells that has been the dominant signal um, that we've seen from these data uh, we're now doing well de dedicated epithelial brushes single cell seek of epithelial brushes and all the rest so one more thing just to kind of drive this home and this is unpublished too, we're kind of working on this paper, the secondary um, is to now, so everything I showed you was from the randomization or the sort of end of study sample, again, when they're healthy. Um, just like in Muppets 1, we collected illness samples. And now we can say, you know, what's up or down during a mepolizumab exacerbation versus a placebo exacerbation. And again, a complicated plot here, this is a heat map showing Z scores, the relative expression of these 12 modules whether you're a MEPO non-exacerbation or cold, a MEPO exacerbation, a placebo cold, a placebo exacerbation, or then I concatenate it on the Muppets 1 data. And this is arrayed in the same order as that figure I just showed you from our main paper. So um, uh, it's a little uh, hard without an arrow, but um, you know, basically what you can see is in those MEPO exacerbations, you see this intense red for those same epithelial pathways being upregulated to a greater degree when having an exacerbation on drug than when having an exacerbation on placebo. I mean, this isn't a crossover, so it's not the same people, but uh, at least at a population level. So, you know, even though it's kind of white there, that those pathways are still higher in a placebo exacerbation than a placebo cold. Um, um, but again, it's highest. And then opposite that, you know, we see those eosinophil pathways um, highest in placebo exacerbations with the exception of, um, it's not labeled terribly well there, but that activation mucus secretion one, which is quite congruent in all exacerbations. So again, it really gives us a sense of what is and what is not perturbed by uh, MEPO and surprisingly congruent, I have to say, uh, of what was observed at baseline and what was observed during illness. Um, so, you know, I mean, that is in a sense uh, one of the main goals of what we're doing here is to really understand um, or predict at some level what we're now actually doing with this is a, uh, a true machine learning prediction approach to say, okay, if you take gene X, Y, and Z, how well can you predict responder status and then validate that in, a, in an independent cohort? Um, well, good. We're, we're pretty good on time, actually. So I'm going to um, kind of now move tangentially that well, everything I just showed you is sort of the uh, hypothesis free. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. We do. So that's um, un incomplete uh, at uh, this point in time. Um, what I will tell you is when we just look at the rate of viral exacerbations in one group or the other, it's not different. So they both get viruses, they both get exacerbations. Um, but when we stratify viral and non-viral within these groups, just like in Muppets 1, they look very different. Um, and it's, it's quite curious. Uh, we haven't added in the pollution data yet. It's kind of a, a beast to pull in all that data. So we're just starting it. Um, but it seems that you know, these triggers uh, are um, relevant on drug or off. Yeah, so it's a good question. The question, I'll just repeat it, is basically, do you see the same in adults, this sort of responder, non-responder status? And I have to tell you, I've been pretty disappointed by the literature and the adult studies that for the most part, that's not done. This is only looked at at an aggregated level, um, you know, as opposed to sort of saying, are there people, you know, who are consistently responding and having zero exacerbations, or there's some who are having the same rate of exacerbations as off drug. So we don't really have a great precedent from the adult literature. And moreover, to the extent that, you know, re exacerbations are reduced by 50% in adults, um, 
other than looking at nasal and bloody eosinophils, which are not pr good predictors of response, and pheno has been looked at, not much has been explored. Um, so, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is sort of promote this or some other methodology akin to this to better, to incorporate, right, into these sorts of randomized controlled trials to better understand. Um, so I, I'm not sure I can give you a data answer to that. I, my, my general answer is, well, it's variable. So you can, you can see, I think one of the things we believe to be the case is that eosinophilic asthma in kids and adults is not the same thing. This is just sort of speculation from our data. Um, you see some adults with super high eosinophils and bad asthma and Again, this part of this is my clinical experience. A lot of that, either they didn't have asthma as kids or it wasn't bad when they were a kid. And you can see kids with very high eosinophils, um, uh, but they are not the ones who evolve into high eosinophil asthmatic adults. So I think they're sort of two different quote unquote forms of eosinophilic asthma that we have yet to fully parse out, but that's really just speculation from me. Yeah, so, um, and part of it, you know, these are associated with neutrophils, but part of this is really an interferon response. Um, and that's, I guess, the next part of my talk to some extent. Um, it's very curious to understand what's going on with neutrophils and interferons um, in the context of type 2 inflammation. And, you know, we've shown in this cohort and others that when you have really high, and this, and with Jason as well, when you have really high T2 inflammation, that can um, impair your interferon responsiveness. Um, but at a certain level during an illness, you actually see the opposite, that both can be uh, high together and that actually higher interferon responses seem to um, be detrimental. Um, and in the, our, our assumption was, and we had some, some in vitro data that kind of hinted at this, was that when you deplete type 2 inflammation, you'll actually increase the basal interferon signaling. We didn't, we didn't see that. Um, I kind of didn't focus on it, but in this figure back here, um, what's on the right of it is the relative change of a module with drug. So you can see that eosinophil modules went down with drug, the epithelial modules tended to go up, the neutrophil modules didn't change with drug or placebo. So our assumption was knockout eosinophils augment basal interferon signaling, it didn't happen. Um, Despite that, and I'll just kind of jump around here. I mean, this is a good discussion. If we, I'll come back to this in a second, but if we look at our Muppets 1 study, we saw two very inverse associations. So this was kind of the analogous Muppets 1 figure for rate of exacerbations. What we identified as the best two predictors was if you have a high expression of the T2 module and a low expression of type 1 interferon, your exacerbation probability or your exacerbations free survival sort of there, right? You, you do poorly. You have exacerbations more often, sooner and, and more frequently is basically what we found. Um, so kind of lacking interferon at a baseline state is a problem. But we also saw that during an illness, this is Muppets 1 again, if you have a viral exacerbation, you actually have this exaggerated interferon response that's the purple versus the black. So you kind of start too low and you go too high um, and that's all bad. Uh, and this actually um, recapitulates. And again, I just kind of want to bring this back to some of the uh, uh, ex vivo work. I mean, this was one of the first studies I did with Jason was, um, you know, the beautiful ALI culture experiments. Here we were able to look at, and we were looking at respiratory syncytial virus at this time, but just in a small number of kids, looking at the relative induction of an interferon response in an airway epithelial culture system. Um, what's shown there is on the left of the heat map, kids who have uh, much higher expression of this are the ones who have um, worse lung function. And that's what you see in the um, you know, regression plot as well. 
kind of recapitulating what we have here that during a respiratory illness, if you, and it's not shown here, but this also associates with lung function in our data, the greater your interferon response, the worse your lung function, at least during that illness. Which brings us to one final finding. This is also unpublished, but as we now look across Muppets 1 and 2, this is this very curious finding where we look at this interferon module and we ask, how does it relate to your lung function during wellness? That's baseline red versus illness. Uh, we basically see too much interferon during illness is a bad thing, uh, lower lung function, but at baseline, it's the opposite. And this is the only module that behaves this way. The other ones kind of have a consistent relationship to lung function, you know, whether you're sick or well. So <laughs> that's, I, I, I initially termed this section, you know, what is, what is driving dysregulation of interferon and asthma? We still don't know that, but we have this very curious finding of how it's dysregulated, um, which is which has sort of shifted the paradigm of how we think of antiviral responses in asthma. Um, well, we have eight minutes. With that, I'm, I, the questions are good, so interrupt. Otherwise, I'm going to tell one more semi-tangential story, but it kind of gets to that question of virus and interferon, and I think of the really nice, uh, again, collaborative work um, that we've done with the Institute here with Jason. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, there. It's a great question, and the short of is that we don't currently have an answer. I mean, the simplest way we can try to answer that is take damage signals from our data and say, how does this associate to damage signals, right? Which we haven't fully done, but could be done. The other way is, to, of course, to try to get some actual histologic or imaging data, which is tricky. We have now started taking um, brushings where we can actually get, you know, sort of um, some level of, of, of assay of that. And in our ITN study, this is in adults, you know, we've actually done nasal biopsies to get at this. And we've shown where some of these pathways are congruent with um, epithelial barrier dysfunction on biopsy histology, but we can't do it in these kids. Um, we've talked about getting uh, various, you know, imaging modalities that might get at it, including MRI, but it's tricky and expensive. So still a, a, a thought experiment at this stage. Yeah, so it gets tricky. I will tell you, so I told you the whole cell deconvolution bit. The reality is for some of these, there is no deconvolution to the cell. So the interferon is one of those that seemed pleiotropic across cell types. Um, it didn't deconvolute to just the macrophage or just the epithelium. And I think it's exactly that, right? It's probably coming from numerous sources. Um, in the single cell data, as <laughs> we've actually seen, even within the epithelium, there's highly variable interferon responsiveness. Um, so it just kind of really, where, where you have these sort of very broad, or, or let's say cell non-specific pathways, it gets complicated uh, to know the source. Uh, the last thing I'll say to that though, is we did adjust everything here for cell proportions, and this is independent of the relative number of macrophages or epithelial cells or neutrophils. So it's sort of above and beyond a change in cell composition. But what's it really coming from? Is good interferon from one cell and bad interferon from another cell? We don't really know at this point. Or yeah, the pathways downstream. I mean, the reality is we never detect interferon. We always detect the, the interferon stimulated genes. All right. Well, again, just to kind of hint at, at this, this is our perhaps most robust single cell data. Uh, kind of getting at some of these questions. And again, uh, great, great work with um, Jason. I'll just kind of say superficially throughout the pandemic or from early in the pandemic, we all assumed asthma would be a bad risk factor. Uh, epidemiologic data didn't really support that. We and others all kind of published, you know, we all were repurposing data at the start and said, hey, ACE2 has changed in type in asthma. Specifically, it's decreased if you have type 2 asthma. So it must be protective, 
this led to this idea that there must be some protective mechanism at play in asthma against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we've explored that now in a couple cohorts. Um, I'm actually just going to skip this one. This is a large clinical cohort where we basically showed type 2 inflammation associates with less severe disease and with lower viral loads. Uh, but then what we've done in these ALI cultures is to show, uh, so basically here we're taking asthmatic and non-asthmatic epithelium, or Jason is taking in his lab, stimulated with or without IL-13 and infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 to look at the pattern of replication by cell. And what was a, what we observed is that first off, asthma epithelium replicates virus less efficiency, uh, efficiently, that's the blue versus the pink on the left. Um, and IL-13 markedly decreases viral copy number as well. And when we then look at bulk RNA-seq, we can see a large IL-13 signature, but only a small subset of it. What's up in the upper left is what seems to be driving or associated with the lower viral load observed in asthma IL-13 stimulated epithelium. We assumed, okay, maybe it's gonna be ACE2 or interferon. What actually seemed to be happening, there was a very curious differential interferon response. But when we went to the single cell data, we could basically now say, here are all these different types of ciliated epithelium within the ALI culture. And here's their relative decrease of viral load on the right. And you can see just a very heterogeneous pattern. So there are a subset of ciliated epithelial clusters, sort of the deep red in the middle, that basically are not replicating virus. Uh, we're not replicating it nearly as efficiently. And when we compare this to healthy, we see that those cells are largely absent. And what we've kind of concluded from this is that quite paradoxically, type two inflammation in this case has a protective effect on the airway, airway epithelium. Uh, by mediating a decrease in FOXJ1 and other important sort of transcriptional regulators, it's kind of impairing the replication of SARS-CoV-2. Anyway, I will end there. I've, I've shown a number of stories. So for the sake of time, we can talk through the conclusions. I'm going to show you a couple of acknowledgement slides. This is the large group I work with, uh, ICAC and now CAUSE, uh, 10 centers, 11 centers actually across the country collecting really good samples. Uh, my team at Benaroya and U Washington uh, listed there. In particular, Naresh has done a lot of beautiful work um, uh, with some of the most recent data I've shown you. The work done here, so really highlighting Jason again, thanks for inviting me in his lab. Uh, so Lucille, Elizabeth, and Maria um, in, in driving forward this eight, uh, airway epithelial work. And then I didn't really show it, but this is the large COVID impact group I work with. So we're just on time. So I'll, I'll end there and happy to continue discussion. Great talk, Matt. You covered a huge amount of ground there. Um, and there's lots of participation from the audience. There really are not any chat questions. So I don't know if there are any other questions in the room. People wanna put forward. Malika. Uh, great talk. So as a clinician, how big do you, would you have to see a difference in like a subgroup of individuals to think that it would be worth like type it, getting into types for the patients before treatment? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. There's no definitive answer to that. But I think, right, this is where the field is moving because these are expensive drugs. They're hard to get approved. You know, how long do you keep somebody on a drug to before you determine if they're a responder or not? So, you know, our current biomarkers are, do you have eosinophils? Do you have IgE? Are you allergic? They're pretty uh, gross, so to speak, and they're pretty inaccurate. So I would argue um, <laughs> anything simple to collect that moves that accuracy needle meaningfully forward is going to be of value. But I, I can't give you a number as to what that should be. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Fantastic. <clears throat>